Hi, I'm Janet Callahan. Today I'm going to be talking about AAC and heritage languages. It's traditional in indigenous communities to use our indigenous introductions first. Kara wapia win imachiapi. Now Janet Callahan wasichiapi imachiapi. Waji ahaha oyanke imataha. In Lakota, I am called Kara wapia win which means she makes good medicine. And in English, my name is Janet Callahan. I am Lakota on my mom's side and German on my dad's side. My family, my mom's family is from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. I am an indigenous neurodivergent mom of indigenous autistic children, one who uses AAC right now and one who used to use AAC. Um, I'm an engineer a degreed engineer working in the auto industry. My AAC experience is all basically on the job training. Um, my son has had a device since he was about three and by the time you see this video he will have turned 13. He is a um, Words for Life user, both on an accent and on an iPad. We have both. So let's talk a little bit before I get started too far about terminology. I promise you I'm going to screw something up terminology wise. Um, and I apologize in advance, I do my best. The preference these days is to use the name of specific tribes and peoples wherever possible. Indian is almost never used by itself to describe indigenous peoples of North America. Um, Although American Indian is in many organization names, and older folks use it a lot, people older than me. Um, most of those organizations have been around longer than I have, and they were using the terminology of the day when they were named. Native American is most commonly used in the US, and First Nations is most commonly used in Canada. Um, note that Alaskan Natives are not called Native Americans, and Hawaiian Natives are not called Native Americans. And the indigenous peoples of Mexico and South America aren't called Native Americans either. So we have all these umbrella terms that don't really cover everything. Um, indigenous is more common among younger people in terms of the bigger community, um, but particularly in, um, I guess, what I would call in internet discussions where lots of different groups are interacting with each other. So what are heritage languages? Heritage languages are the language you speak at home. Whether that's because you're an immigrant whose home country didn't speak English and you speak that other language at home, but you speak English in the community, or whether that's an indigenous language that was here before Columbus arrived that people now speak mostly only at home because they speak English at school and in the community. Most indigenous languages are endangered, um, particularly in Canada and the US. There are lots of revitalization activities going on though. And why do these languages matter? Language impacts the way we think and the way we see the world. The way we talk about things changes how we see them. Language and culture are really intertwined. Language ties us to our families and to our history, and language also has ties to religion, spirituality, and traditional um, practices, holidays, and so on. You can't untangle culture and language. They inform each other. So let me tell you a little bit about our project. Um, last year, due to COVID, we ended up withdrawing our children from school to homeschool. We had poked at trying to learn Lakota a little bit, um, at least I had. But I had sort of not pushed it real hard with the kids because both of them have language difficulties with expressive and receptive language. And because Alex is an AAC user, um, we were led to believe that if he was having trouble with English, how would he ever learn a second language? So 
once we started homeschooling, things changed a little bit because our understanding of how Alex learns and what Alex learns changed dramatically. We decided as a family to add Lakota to our schooling. Um, none of us are really fluent in it, but that's okay. We'll all learn it together. Um, and we were already including cultural things on a pretty regular basis, like traditional storytelling and traditional um, foods and those sorts of things. So it just made sense to keep adding to that traditional level. Um, mostly we're using games and stories and flashcards. We have textbooks, but we don't use them a lot. We don't use textbooks a lot for anything, really. Um, we're very child-centered and child-directed. Once we really started talking about this, though, it became clear that Alex has sounds that he just can't pronounce. And there are, and that's in English. There are sounds in Lakota that don't exist in English at all. So he was clearly going to have to have some sort of AAC device. So I went looking. There aren't any. There are, as far as I can tell, no AAC devices for any indigenous languages in North America. So then the question came back around to, well, can he really learn a second language? Um, because, yeah, you know, his accent has Spanish on it and his iPads have Spanish on them. But when we were in school, school was very much like, yeah, you know, this isn't, this isn't going to work. Um, in fact, Alex is, Alex's elementary school you had a Spanish class every other week, and Alex's therapy sessions with the speech therapist ended up being booked on top of his Spanish class so that they could do that instead of taking away from other instructional time. Um, so let's talk about multilingual users. There are a lot more multilingual users than I anticipated once I started looking. Um, I know several adults who know multiple languages, more than just two. Um, and if our thought process is that we presume competence in terms of language and in, in terms of what non-speaking students understand, regardless of what they can tell us, then we have to assume they can do just about anything that anybody else their age would do. And lots and lots of people speak more than one language. Speaking only one language is pretty much a U.S. rarity. Um, it's pretty uncommon here to really be fluent in more than one language. But in most other places in the world, something like 70 or 80 percent of the population fluently speaks more than one language. So we're sort of an outlier in that respect. Um, and I guess I feel like a lot of the time we're so focused on trying to get it right in the primary language, English, that we haven't really considered what else nonverbal students are capable of. Um, Alex still doesn't really have a good, good grasp on grammar 10 years into this, but he gets his ideas across and there's no reason he can't learn more, more languages, more words, whatever. Um, one of the things that came up in my research, though, is that heritage languages complicate AAC learning. They complicate language learning in general. Um, I should point out that we live in a very diverse suburb of Detroit. In the elementary school that my kids attended, which has about a one mile square, one mile by one mile sort of attendance area, there are 500 students, plus or minus a few, and of them, 60% don't speak English at home. A substantial portion of those students come in as English learners, and um, of those 60% of 500 kids, there, there are 30 languages spoken. So when we talk about giving a child an English AAC device, we're limiting them to one community. 
if they only have English and that's the language we use here in the community, how do they communicate with people at home? It's easy to think, oh, everybody's here, they're, they're all learning English, but my high school German teacher knew German because in the 60s his grandparents didn't speak English. They were recent German immigrants, they didn't speak any English, and if he wanted to communicate with his grandparents, he had to learn German, so everybody at home spoke German. It's not that uncommon. Um, you can go into many different restaurants here in our area from different cultures and different countries, and there are frequently relatively young children doing their homework and managing the front counter because they can converse with clients, with customers, and then explain it in their home language. But if we're only giving a student a single language on their AAC device, we're keeping them from being able to do that. Um, we should be considering more often, are the family members fluent enough in the dominant language to model fluently on an AAC device? Um, I have friends who's, who, during the pandemic, their, their parents have worked with their children. So grandma keeping the children during virtual schooling. And grandma doesn't speak enough English to understand how to set up the computer for the child to be online for school. So if that's the problem, how is grandma going to communicate with that AAC device? I think this happens a lot more frequently than we realize. Additionally, for, for young children, if there are two languages spoken in the home and one of them is the preferred language, have they actually learned enough of the dominant language to be fluent enough to use an AAC device in it. I was recently reading an article where a bilingual family who thought they spoke really pretty good English, one parent spoke English and one parent spoke Spanish at home. When their kids started kindergarten, they tested them for proficiency in English and they tested out as not proficient. And it wasn't that they weren't proficient, it was just a difference in knowing two languages and which language did they use more comfortably. Um, and then two, is the family willing to use that dominant language at home if that's what's on the AAC device? Or, you know, how do they, how do they manage that at home? That's a huge problem that has to be sorted out. And I feel like a lot of times we probably leave families just to figure it out on their own without a lot of support. Now, one of the easy things we could do is translate the entire device. Um, CoughDrop has a feature where you can like run the whole thing through Google Translate and it just translates every word in the device. But not every language uses the same grammar, not every language translates words the same way. We don't all form sentences the same way. It works best to translate like that when you're talking about really similar languages. Um, Western European languages, for example, Romance languages and some Germanic languages, not even all of those. When the State Department talks about which languages are the hardest to learn and the easiest to learn, the easiest ones are ones that have lots of cognates and use similar sentence structures. It's things like French. If you know English, it's things like French and Spanish. The next hardest is things like German and some of these that have similar sentence structure, a few cognates, but not much else in common. The next batch is more complex, and the level four languages are things like Arabic, and Chinese, Korean, where the structure is really, really different, where grammar works differently, where um, words just work differently, and where tone matters, and all of these other things. Um, the State Department doesn't put indigenous languages on their list, but based on their criteria, Lakota is probably a level four language. It's as hard as learning Arabic or Chinese. Um, so we have our work cut out for us. 
and we can't just translate words for life and hope it works. Um, also, voices matter. Um, as I was saying earlier, there are sounds in Lakota that don't exist in English. And we have tried try phonetically spelling them with English le letters to try and get there, and it is uh, both hilarious and useless. Um, there's a TED Talk out there by Kalika Bali, who is a language scientist who works for Microsoft. And she talks about how the vast majority of research and resources go to four languages, English, Spanish, Arabic, and Cantonese and that everybody else is just sort of left hanging. Um, those resources don't go to those languages, and because there are no resources in those languages, nobody studies them, so there are no resources to go to those languages, and it's a cyclic problem, and it's self-replicating. So let's talk about what this really means. We want to make our project available to anyone who speaks Lakota or Dakota or Nakota, which are um, related languages, related dialects. And we want to do it relatively cheaply because it's a big deal. Current estimates are 1 in 54 children have autism, 20 to 40 percent have difficulty speaking, and there are somewhere between 20 and 40,000 people on our reservation alone, one of six or seven at least that fall into those Lakota Siouan languages. Um, and if you run these numbers out, the estimate is that there are 80 people on our reservation who would make good use of a device like this. That's not a ton, but it's an important link to our culture for them. Additionally, Native American children are dramatically underdiagnosed with autism, partly because some of the things that we talk about as being classically autistic don't actually apply in our culture. Um, the big one for me is eye contact. Looking somebody in the eyes is considered rude and you know, a challenge to somebody else's authority. And so we just don't do that. So that's not the thing that I was worried about with my kids when we started talking about diagnoses. I was more concerned about their inability to follow directions and their inability to be safe in certain places and those sorts of things. Um, AAC has been shown to improve verbal speech in the long run, and there are lots of other reasons you might need AAC, not just autism. Um, we have many of them in our little household here. Um, my kids are, ex uh, genetics believes we have a genetic disorder of some sort. Um, they've been diagnosed with cerebral palsy and with autism. Uh, one of them has epilepsy and lost words due to seizures for, for a while. So there's lots going on. Um, and in particular, kids on our reservation don't always have access to all of the therapies that we have access to here. So let's talk a little bit about language revitalization and why it matters. Um, in the 1860s, the government started operating Indian schools um, these boarding schools meant to make people into, into good white people. Um, there was one in the news recently in Canada where 215 bodies were found in a mass grave, for example. All of these schools, as far as we can tell, were abusive. All of them required to children to speak only English. There are family members of mine who have now passed away. They're older who I knew as a child, who were beaten for speaking Lakota. And in an attempt to protect my grandmother and others her age, they didn't teach her how to speak Lakota. They didn't teach her anything traditional um, because they were hoping to protect her. But this is also not ancient history. 
um, the vast majority of the battles between the U.S. government and the Native American tribes in the West ended in December 1890. Wounded Knee is just down the road from our property on the reservation. Um, my great-grandparents were born just a few years after that um, and went to boarding schools. My German great-grandparents were born a few years later than that. Most of them were born in Germany, and my grandmother on that side of the family spoke German up into the 40s. She actually went to school, a school that taught everything basically in German. Um, so it's a huge difference in what people expect in their community. Um, we lived in a small German town in the Midwest where most people's names were still German in like the 1980s and where in the 30s most business was done in German regardless of who you were or where you were from. Um, there are virtually no businesses or government agencies on our reservation where Lakota is the expected language. Language revitalization takes work. We have a few books, a few TV shows. They've uh, dubbed the Berenstain Bears, um, some YouTube videos, flashcards, programs similar to Duolingo, lots of TikTok videos from, from reasonably fluent speakers, many lessons on social media. There are a few immersion programs in schools, but we don't live near the reservation. So we don't have access to those, um, but also most of them don't include special ed students. The preschools do because on our reservation preschool, everybody, everybody qualifies for Head Start. Everybody qualifies for Head Start. 99% um, of kids qualify for free lunches. But once they get into kindergarten-ish age, special ed students lose out, and that's not, that's not right, and it's not fair. So the solution we've been working on this year, in sort of parallel with learning language and teaching language, um, has been to start building our own. We're using CoughDrop, um, largely because it's really accessible at a lower cost, and it'll run on almost anything which in an, in an area where um, there were so few computers and so little internet access that virtual school was delivered by school bus in the form of packets of paperwork and worksheets for the week. Um, it, it's going to be a big deal for people to be able to access it at, at a reasonable cost. Lakota grammar is dramatically different from English. Um, the word that translates as red is actually a verb in Lakota, and it encompasses the entire sentence. It is red. There's irregular verb patterns, but also I could say I am red by adding a syllable to the word. And I can say you are red by adding a syllable to the word. And in more complex verbs than it is read, to be read, um, there are cases where I can add a, a syllable as an affix in the middle of the word for the subject and a syllable for the object. So I can have one a one word sentence that says like she threw it or you know those sorts of things she threw them they threw her whatever um, and then there's the voice output issue there are no Lakota voices there are no voices for any indigenous language in the US <laughs> we could record words that's what I hear a lot in um, online groups of parents and SLPs, that for things like um, Amish families, they record the Old German. 
we've been at this a while now. Um, voices matter. Voices matter a lot. And I don't think we take that into account as much as we should either. Um, Alex has a vocal ID voice that he's had since he was about five or six. We're hitting that point in puberty where we have to start talking about a new voice because it doesn't really sound like him anymore. Um, but when we start about talking about changing the voices, he's always very nervous because he identifies with that voice. He identifies with voices that pronounce words the way he thinks they should be pronounced. In Lakota, because the sounds are so different, I can't just use an English voice. I could record all of these words for him, but then he would be talking to me with my voice. And that's a little weird. Additionally, he wouldn't be able to spell words and have them speak those words. And when he was smaller, I didn't realize how big of a deal that would be. Um, but the bigger he gets, the older he gets, the better his spelling gets, the more I realize how much being able to spell something that's not in your device opens up to you. What I really want is Lakota voices. Um, so, Facebook thinks that Lakota is Czech, so we're using a Czech voice right now, and it works reasonably. Um, it's not amazing, but it's better than trying to spell everything in English. It pronounces W's as B's, typical of many Germanic languages, European languages. Um, when I asked around about voices, I don't get a lot of input from people on how to get it done. Um, Acapella has told me kind of what we have to give them before they can even give us a quote, and it's a lot of data. Um, when developing this vocabulary, we started with this motor planning aspect of it because for Alex, LAMP was life-changing. Um, having those motor plans matters for him a lot. Less so as he gets older, but in the beginning it was a huge deal. Um, so one of the things we're doing is we have a template for a verb pattern that has like a grid of all the subjects and objects, and you can plug in all of the words. Um, so first person singular verbs are always in the same place. The reduplicated verbs are always in the same place and so on and so forth. Um, it's very time consuming to set up that way, but it's the same thing that other people with other languages that use a lot of suffixes and prefixes and affixes are doing because none of us can figure out a better way to make it work in any software. So if you're one of those people who studies how languages work and how to make AAC work, based on linguistic properties, this would be a key thing to go look at. Um, we are using categories for nouns. There are so many verbs and so many things that are verbs in Lakota that are not verbs in English that it seemed like our only way to address it. Once we get all the words in, maybe I'll rethink that, but right now this is um, sort of a, a throw it all on the wall and see what sticks approach. Um, one of the things we've noticed is that it takes a lot fewer tries of modeling for Alex to grasp what we're trying to get him to do. He knows how device works, so it's just a matter of pairing that new, new vocabulary and the place on the device. He thrives with these online tools for learning languages. The app that we have that's like Duolingo, but for Lakota, is all online. It's like it reads you a word and you pick the picture. It gives you a picture and you pick the word. And those things we can focus on because those are things he's really actually pretty good at. How the pronunciation works and how the grammar works, that'll all fall into place eventually, I think. Um, so this is what our main board looks like right now. We have a bunch of like, yes, no, go, stop, good, bad type words up here. Almost all of these are verbs, but they're not verbs in this um, setup. These are just 
sort of quick hit words. And all about me, a greetings page, a keyboard, numbers, time, questions. These are all nouns. Um, one of the things I've learned is that core words in English are not core words in Lakota. <laughs> um, and that's been a big, a big deal for me to figure out, right? So if this works, this is recorded um, and presented with Alex's permission. I should probably make sure you can hear this. Let's see. Hopefully this works. All right. Hi, Alex. Hey, if I say, Dako Inichiapi, hey, what do you say? Alex Salahan Emachiapi. Good job. <laughs> What if I ask you, do you know how to say blue? How do you say blue? Bo? Good job. So before anybody gets too worked up about the quizzing him using the device, we don't quiz him using the device in English, we do have to quiz in Lakota because that's part of learning a second language. We try as much as we can to make it more like modeling is for an AAC user, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, and sometimes you just have to ask, do you know what this word is? Do you know what the word for this is? So um, it's a work in progress. All right, play it again. Next page. All right, so considerations. Core words are different, really different, partly because of the change in verbs and verb structure. Um, you know, in English, we use words like more and turn because they have lots and lots of different ways you can use them. In Lakota, turn, there are like five different words for turn, and they each mean something different. Um, animals and plants are huge in our vocab list because they're very commonly used as names and in traditional ceremonies and in other things you see all the time. So if you're talking about place names or people names, you have to have all of those words. Um, we've also had to add a whole category for things like traditional tools and ceremonies and objects because these things are everyday things. Um, we have to talk about feathers and we have to talk about smudging and we have to talk about in nipis, which are sweat lodges. And so all of those things have to be included for the device to really be useful. So we're seeking wider implementation because I can't do anything small and easy. Um, we're working with some to try and get some partnerships with reservation schools. Um, also in the nearby city, and I say nearby because it's like an hour and a half away, and I say city, I mean like 40,000 people-ish, which is not a city by my definition here in Michigan, but it is what you get in South Dakota. Rapid City has some Lakota immersion programs in their elementary schools, and several of the reservation schools do as well. So we're reaching out to all of them to talk with them about um, working together to get this into the hands of students. Um, disability is seen really differently in most indigenous societies. It's not like something where you're a separate person. It's just how you are. And there's um, It's really hard to explain that difference to folks, but it is not always about fixing the problem. It's not always about giving a tool that will alleviate the problem because it's not necessarily seen as a problem. It's just seen as the way you are. So um, we have to work within that paradigm as well, within that cultural 
expectation. Um, we're hoping to do some beta testing this school year. Um, I'm hoping to have 2,000 words by then. I'm at about 500, so there's a lot of work to do. Um, <clears throat> and then we're hoping to fundraise a little bit to provide licenses and devices to students because, again, um, Pine Ridge is really poor. There are lots of words people throw around to talk about it being under-resourced and this and that and the other thing. The truth is the average income per person is less than $10,000 a year. About a third of houses don't have running water or electricity. So to expect families to try and come up with a device, with money for a device or for an iPad and a license is un unreasonable. And to try and c convince insurance to pay for a second device for a child who's already using one in English is not going to work. Our bigger goal is a voice engine that works properly. Um, we're going to start reaching out to resource, um, to research labs that do voice work to try and figure out how we could get there. Um, I have some references here. We'll provide the slides with this presentation. Um, some of the bilingual AAC things that I've read over the last few months. Um, some things about diversity. Diversity's had a huge um, bit of discussion in recent, probably the last year, year and a half, in terms of things like icon sets that are diverse, um, which has turned into a big issue for us too. Um, the open symbol set, for example, is not as diverse in some respects as it really needs to be to be useful, and we're trying to figure out how we account for that in our in our vocabulary. Um, these are all the references on autism in Native American populations, and I think that's it. Thank you so much for listening today, and have a great conference.